Instead, you play as a dominatrix running through a torture dungeon. Hey guys, I'm RNG Gamer. I play all my games randomly. Welcome to my game room and welcome to Beating the Backlog, where I review and talk about the games that were picked for me to play randomly. I finished six games this time and man, was it a wide assortment, let me tell you. Also, my birthday is coming up and just like last year, instead of getting something for myself, I want to give $100 to one of the viewers out there. So you're gonna have to stick around and watch the whole video to figure out how to win the $100. And first up, we have a horror game that I streamed on this channel. We beat the whole game on the channel. I have every game in the series and I had never played any of them until this one, and it's Silent Hill. So Silent Hill is absolutely a classic game and it's considered to be one of the originators of the survival horror genre. So there were survival horror games that came before it, obviously, Resident Evil did, but Silent Hill really contributed to locking that entire formula into place. And the story you play is Harry, and he's on vacation in a town called Silent Hill when his daughter goes missing. He's looking for her, and of course, everything starts going absolutely insane. There's this strange fog that rolls in over the city, and the world keeps shifting from like this figurative nightmare to this literal one. <laughs> I don't want to spoil too much, but the whole atmosphere is insane. And the game plays like you would expect. It's your standard PS1 kind of survival horror game with tank controls, there's limited ammo, there's limited healing, there's a bunch of like puzzles in the game you have to solve to make progress, there's tons of exploration and backtracking, all the stuff you'd expect. I think this is like the best looking and most impressive technically PlayStation 1 game I've ever seen. There's tons of atmosphere, it's like palpable, you can feel it when you're playing the game. There's so much detail, it's really mind-blowing they were able to do this on the PS1. The sound design is fantastic. There's stereo sound. You can hear where the enemies are coming from if you have like a surround sound system or you're playing with headphones, which is like unprecedented on the PS1 as far as I know of. The music likewise is really incredible and really like kind of adds to that creepy atmosphere that you're experiencing in this game. And overall, the entire presentation of Silent Hill is just unbelievable. I, I find it to be absolutely remarkable. There's some real standouts in this. Other than the fact that the game is just good, I will say that I love how challenging the puzzles were. Some of them like blew my mind and I streamed this online so I had like, you know, the people in chat helping me out a little bit. I told them not to like give it away, but if I asked for help for them to chime in and maybe give me a clue and some of those puzzles, boy, let me tell you, they are not easy. I mean, you can figure them out, but they really stretch your mental capacity, <laughs> to say the least. I think some of them were like the hardest puzzles I've ever experienced in a game. I mean, they were way up there, especially for a survival horror game, and I really liked that. A few of them maybe, especially like the Zodiac puzzle, needed a little bit more direction or maybe just a little bit more of a clue because I feel like the whole Zodiac thing was a bit of a red herring. It was sending me down the wrong path and it really had nothing to do with the puzzle. <laughs> so you can't always trust your instincts on these puzzles. And I think that was kind of interesting. The tank controls don't feel bad in this. I didn't really have any issue with them. And I think the exploration and the amount of ammo and stuff they gave you, especially on normal, which is what I played it on, is reasonable. The game's challenge was fair, it wasn't too bad, but there are a few things about the game that I didn't necessarily love. First of all, the enemies, especially outside, like in the, the city area, they just respawn infinitely. And I don't really like that. Every time you go back through that area, they come back and you have to fight them again. And I really just kind of want to explore the town of Silent Hill and just soak it in. The way I kind of had to play it was that I just ran through the area to like avoid these enemies and save my ammo, and I didn't like that. I, I felt like the game was kind of preventing me from doing what I wanted to do, which was just kind of like, after I cleared out the enemies, really get to take in the sights of Silent Hill, right? Even now, I don't have like a good sense of the way the city's laid out or what landmarks are in which locations. It's just, it's all scrambled because I ran through everything so quickly to get away from the constantly respawning enemies. I also wish the story was a little bit more fleshed out. It's really interesting, but they didn't go really deep into it and they kind of like skimmed over the surface of what was really happening. I know they were kind of going for like, oh, you're stuck in this situation that's bigger than what you are and 
yeah, you're a part of it, but like you're not the focus of it. Now, I know this game has like five endings in it, and I'm pretty sure they flesh out more of the story in each of the five endings, but I feel like you should have gotten, you know, 80% of the story in any playthrough you played through, and then like leave the other 20% as bonus content for getting the other endings or whatever, you know? Like each one should maybe reveal 5% more of the story. Cause I don't have time to play through the game five times. And honestly, I don't really want to play through the game five times. I want to keep that spooky atmosphere that I enjoyed so much the first time. And the more you play the game, the less, you know, scared you are because you get more familiar with it. This is one of the best games I've played this year. I was constantly blown away by the detail in the game and obviously it's a classic for a reason. Well, that was an experience to say the least and I really enjoyed streaming this with all of you fans out there. And I'm really looking forward to playing this. So, Aaron G, how did you enjoy your time in Silent Hill? Well, Bring is a town. Silent Hill is like terrifying. It's pretty stressful with those respawning enemies and it's a really scary game for something that's 20 years old. It's funny to hear you say that. Because I personally found the experience to be quite enjoyable. Yeah, I knew you'd say something like that. I don't know if you're here to like torture me or if you're on my side, but I really appreciate you dressing up as my favorite character from the game that I accidentally let die. <laughs> that was a nice touch. So, Silent Hill on the PlayStation 1 was absolutely incredible. I thought it was a fantastic game. Like I said, it's one of the best games I've played all year. And I have to say, while it isn't quite perfect, it really holds its own against a lot of modern games and definitely against a lot of games from that time period. So Silent Hill is a nine out of 10. It's incredible. This next game I played co-op with my daughter. I have played this and beaten it before, but it used to be digital only. So when Limited Run Games put out a physical version, I grabbed it and I played it again. And it's Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, The Game. And this is the complete edition. So this was one of the most desired games to be released physically for me and a lot of other people. So Scott Pilgrim has to beat up his girlfriend's seven evil exes. That's the whole premise of Scott Pilgrim if you've ever read the, I guess it's a graphic novel or a comic book series or seen the movie with Michael Cera. And what you do is you just bash your way through seven really awesome stages that are all super varied and unique and a lot of fun and you know, your typical beat em up fashion. The game takes its inspiration from like River City Ransom on the NES if you've ever played that game. And it's a normal beat em up, but as you defeat enemies, you collect money and you can, you know, take that money into these shops that are hidden around the stages and you can buy food and other trinkets and stuff to basically level up your character and make them stronger. Along the way, you also gain XP, which unlocks new moves. And I believe like the max level is 16 or 17, so there are 16 or 17 additional moves you can get with each character, and you pull them off by doing things like double jumping and kicking and like tap tap forward, and things like that. I think that's a really good system as opposed to a lot of beat em ups that just give you like 17 moves right off the bat, and they're just like, figure them out. This one, you get a chance to, you know, get used to each move once you unlock it and figure out how to use it effectively before they throw another one on top of you, which I, I really liked. My daughter really appreciated it <laughs> for sure. So the graphics and music are obviously super retro inspired and they are incredible. This is one of the best looking beat em ups I've ever seen. And the areas are like, insanely detailed. There's tons of character and so much charm. There are like pop culture references everywhere and it's just like a feast for the eyes. The music, like I said, unbelievably catchy. It's worth listening to outside of the game. And I forget the name of the guy that did the graphics for this game, but he's, he's done a lot of other things in this style. He is without a doubt like one of the best in the field. As I think back on this game, and like I said, I played it over 10 years ago on the Xbox 360, it stands out in my mind more than any other beat-em-up I've ever played. There's so many interesting events and things that happened and scenarios that like just stuck with me. And the charm of the game is unlike anything I've ever seen. I loved it. 
But even though I'm obviously really fond of this game, it's not perfect. There are a few things about it that kind of drove me and my daughter crazy. For one, the enemies block way too often and their blocks are really hard to break through. You have to do some strange like combo to get through them. And typically you're sitting there, you know, punching away and another enemy walks up behind you and like whacks you in the back of the head. <laughs> it's annoying. And it's hard to break through defenses. And my little girl, she's not used to doing like combinations on the controller. So she would just sit there and punch the same guy over and over and over again, trying to get him to like put down his guard and it just wouldn't happen. And I have to stop what I was doing to go over there and help her. There's a lot of that going back and forth. And I feel like their guard breaks should have broken after maybe like three or four punches and not like 60 punches. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not as big of an exaggeration as it sounds like. <laughs> it was challenging to get through their defenses. Whenever I play a game co-op with my daughter that I review on this channel, I ask her what she thought of it. And she says that it was a really frustrating, but a really good game. So this isn't the best beat-em-up I've ever played, but it is the most memorable beat-em-up I've ever played. And I think it's a fantastic game. When it came out, I hadn't seen a beat em up game in a long time. Like there was Castle Crashers that maybe came out shortly before or after this and then this game and then like there's a 10 year gap where nothing really came out. Now we're getting them all the time. People are going back to that style and they're enjoying it. This still hangs in there with some of like the more modern kind of great beat em ups that have come out. So Scott Pilgrim versus the world, the game, it's like an eight out of 10, it's great. I would highly recommend this one if you just like action games or beat em ups. It's a lot of fun. What if I told you that there is a Tomb Raider game, but instead of playing as Lara Croft running through the jungle or some ancient ruins somewhere, instead you play as a dominatrix running through a torture dungeon? That game totally exists. <laughs> and it's called Death Trap Dungeon and it's on the PlayStation 1. So let me just say this first. I tried playing this on the PS3, which is supposed to be backwards compatible, and it wouldn't let me select which character I wanted to use, and there also was no sound. So this game doesn't really work on the PlayStation 3. You have to play it on a PlayStation 1 or a PlayStation 2, and I'm playing it on the PlayStation 2 here. The Evil Baron has concocted this perilous dungeon below his castle, and he's invited adventurers from all over the land to come, you know, for the challenge. And if you survive, you get incredible wealth but if you fail, the evil baron gets your soul. So that's the whole premise. You can choose between a male or a female character, and like always, I picked the female character because if I'm gonna be staring at something for hours, I'd rather it be a female. <laughs> so I mentioned this game is like Tomb Raider. The reason I said that is because it's made by Eidos, the same company that made Tomb Raider. It plays just like Tomb Raider, and it looks just like Tomb Raider, you know, in its graphical style. It has the tank controls, just like the original Tomb Raider, which makes sense, you know, <laughs> they were made by the same company. And it's a dungeon crawler with like a really strong emphasis on solving these puzzles. And this game is extremely unforgiving. And it's pretty cheap at times too. I mean, a lot of the traps, just like a trap is supposed to be, you don't know it's there and you run into them constantly and they kill you. And the save points come like few and far between and it can be a little hard to get through a challenge to get to the next save point. And health potions and things like that are, you know, they're rare. But that's kind of the point, right? It's supposed to be this really challenging dungeon to give you all your wildest dreams. The game opens with this like really campy but totally awesome cinematic cutscene that shows what it's like being inside the dungeon if you're basically a bumbling idiot. <laughs> and I enjoyed that a lot. And that really set up the game and got my expectations really high. And like I said, I, I jumped into the game and I loved the atmosphere. I loved the premise of the game. And the first couple few hours I played of the game, I was having a really good time. But, but, <laughs> the tank controls of this are pretty clunky. As you would expect, tank controls usually are pretty clunky, but this one felt a, like a little bit towards that higher end of clunkiness. They were more clunky than I was used to. <laughs> And the camera in this is absolutely terrible and it really messes you up is it tends to kind of like point in the opposite direction from where you actually want it to go. A lot of time you're like facing into the camera running towards the screen like Crash Bandicoot style, which is frustrating when you know there's traps all in front of you and enemies spawning out of nowhere and things like that. You constantly just run into them when you're not expecting to and it can, you know, end your run in no time whatsoever. 
the enemies in the traps zone in from basically nowhere with no clues or anything that they're going to be coming up and that can get a little frustrating when you're like 85 percent of the way through a level and you're running towards the exit and then you're about to pull a switch and like five minotaurs just teleport in directly behind you and whack you before you can turn around and block or anything you really need to know they're going to be there and that's the crux of the game like they want you to play through it over and over and over and over and over and over and memorize where everything's going to be and slowly like develop your knowledge of the game to the point where you have a flawless memory of every trap and every enemy in the dungeon and how to get through every obstacle and everything they throw at you. And really the only way to get good at this is just through trial and error, which I hate. Like it's not relying on my skills as a gamer. It's relying on me like trading my time for something that's frustrating to be able to make progress in the game. This game really reminds me of like Super Meat Boy. <laughs> where you have these really, really hard stages that you have to play over and over and over again to learn to master. Except like in Super Meat Boy, when you die, you lose like the last 30 seconds. In this game, when you die, you lose like the last 30 minutes. And it can really add up. I think that the premise and the idea of this game were really cool, but the execution of it just let me down, right? I wanted to really love this game, and I did for the first few hours, but then I just got absolutely annihilated by the game over and over and over again. And if you look online, people say things like, man, this game was super unfair and I hate this game and it's no fun. And then other people are like, you can knock this game out in an afternoon. Maybe if you know exactly what to do, but I did not have a good time with it towards the end and I actually gave up on it. I just quit it. I got too frustrated and I wasn't having fun anymore. Tank controls are fine on slower based games. But on games where there's like time limits and a bunch of like precision platforming and things like that, you need tighter controls. And this game just doesn't have it. So how was Death Trap Dungeon? I would say it was pretty mediocre. I'd give it a five out of 10. I loved things about it. I hated things about it. So it kind of ended up in the middle, which is where no game ever needs to be <laughs> on the fence. If this one looks good to you, maybe give it a shot. It's really cheap. If what I've said dissuaded you from playing it, then I've done my job as well. So I, like most people, love the Neo Geo. And one of the premier series on the Neo Geo is the Metal Slug series. And I was excited to play a game in the series that I had never played before because it's a handheld Metal Slug game. And it's Metal Slug first mission on the Neo Geo Pocket Color Selection Volume 1. It looks kind of crazy, and this is what it looks like while you're playing it. As you can see on the screen, it has like the Neo Geo Pocket Color console, and you're playing in a small window. I mean, obviously, this has lost a lot of the incredible graphics from the arcade games, and the Metal Slug games are known for being highly detailed, and their sprite work is like the greatest of all time, all that. You know, everything you've heard. We all know about it, right? This looks pretty plain. And I will say the music is not nearly as good as the other Metal Slug games. So going into this, don't expect that full cosmetic Metal Slug experience you would want. But getting that out of the way, the game does play the same as the other Metal Slug games. You run and gun your way through a bunch of enemies and it's super challenging, maybe not as challenging as the arcade Metal Slug games, but still puts up a fair challenge for a handheld. But it does gain some really interesting elements that the console versions and arcade versions on the Neo Geo proper don't have. There are these like non-linear levels where you have to explore and find your way through by going in different doors and jumping across certain platforms and finding hidden routes and things like that. There are some shmup stages that are pretty interesting. There are some stages where you like parachute down and you have to land they really put a lot of variety into this and i found that to be really engaging there's another really interesting feature in this that makes it stand out above all the other metal slug games that i know of and that's that certain levels are only accessible by doing really well or really poorly in a certain stage for example in one of the shmup stages if you succeed you land on an island and proceed you know along with your assault but if you get shot down, the next stage is you skydiving and then parachuting safely onto a different part of the island that you then have to play through. At one point, I got killed in like an enemy base and instead of losing a life, I woke up in a prison cell and had to escape from the prison using nothing but a knife. 
That's really flipping cool. That's amazing. I wish the games on the like Neo Geo proper had something like that. These extra features are really cool and it helps the game stand out as more than just like a dumbed down version of the arcade Metal Slug. But there's a thing or two I hate about this game. <laughs> Even though there are several routes, the whole experience is pretty short and it, it is, like I said, it's a challenge but it's a lot easier than the arcade games. And since you can save your game and start back where you left off, you should be able to like beat this game in just a couple of hours with no issues whatsoever. As opposed to like the weeks it may take you to learn to grind your way through a Metal Slug game on the arcade. This is an engaging experience and I had a great time. My daughter watched me play it. I played through it twice and I tried to find all the alternate routes and I got most of them. I had a good time, but after two playthroughs I'd had my fill of the game. Now Metal Slug first mission on the Neo Geo Pocket Color is a really fun game. It's not as good or as memorable as the arcade games, but those extra features and the alternate routes and things really elevates it a lot. And considering this is a handheld game, it's probably like one of the best, if not the best on the entire console. I don't know, I'm just guessing. I've only played two games on it. <laughs> so I would say Metal Slug First Mission is a good game. It's a seven out of 10, but it's very close to being an eight out of 10. So you guys know how much I love shoot 'em ups and none of these videos would ever be complete without one. So here's another one for you. Konami decided to take their Gradius series and put a bunch of crazy humor into it and they called it the Parodius series. Gradius plus parody equals Parodius. And I played that first game in the series, which I had played before, but I never really delved into it till now. And it is Parodius on the Parodius collection on the PSP. Lots of P sounds. <laughs> Parodius Portable PSP. So this originally came out on the MSX computer. If you've never played an MSX game before, they all kind of look like this. So they remade the game just for this collection. But the gameplay is supposed to be the same. It's not, but it's supposed to be. <laughs> This plays pretty much like all the other Gradius games. It has the same power-up system where when you defeat waves of enemies, you get these little power-up icons that move this gauge at the bottom of the screen. And each one of the blocks on the gauge represents a different power-up. And as it moves along, you can press a button and activate that power-up. One may be like a double shot, one may be a shield, one may be a, an option or a little helper, one may be a speed up. And you kind of like build your upgrades as you go along. But as the case with most of the games in the series, you get like pretty much fully powered up by the middle of the first stage. And it's just about maintaining your power ups and not getting killed. Parodius also adds the really annoying and stupid bell juggling mechanic from Twin B that I freaking hate. It's one of my least favorite mechanics in any game. The problem with the bells is that as you shoot them, they like bounce up and you have to keep juggling them to rotate them through the different various power ups that you get. They block your shots and they also force you to like line up with the belt. So you can't focus on shooting the enemies and you can't really focus on dodging the enemy bullets well because you have to like line up and focus on this freaking belt. And I hate that crap. It like takes me out of the things I love about a shoot 'em up. And I hate that they put this into the Parodius games because I want to love this series so much. And like I said, we've basically taken Gradius, we've taken Twinbee, and we've stuck it into this crazy and zany comedy-based world. Instead of shooting like aliens and battleships, you're shooting hot dogs and flower shops and all kinds of other wacky stuff, toenail clippers, things like that. And the graphics are fine, but I actually kind of like the chunky low-res MSX graphics better that you saw. <laughs> I think that's more charming. And the soundtrack is really good, as it is with most Konami games from the time period. It's your standard classical fare that they've changed up a little bit. You, you hear Wagner and Mussorgsky and Beethoven and a lot of the classical things you would know if you watched like Looney Tunes growing up. And you know what makes this game stand out? It feels like playing Gradius more or less, but the humor and the atmosphere and you know the presentation, that's the draw to this game. But the downside to it is that the game is unbelievably difficult like 11 out of 10 difficult guys and it's full of all this crap that they put in there to just troll you like at the bottom of the screen on the grid there's a power up that if you select it by accident it will erase all of your flipping upgrades there's no reason to do that other than just to like piss you off <laughs> 
There's even one color of bell that if you like accidentally pick it up, it makes the little power up grid at the bottom start rotating. So the chances of you accidentally landing on the one that erases all your upgrades, the probability of that goes way up. And it's annoying that it like turns the integral part of the game that you need to progress into like a random slot machine. You know, there's like a 20% chance it'll land on the spot that like screws you over. Also, the enemies are constantly just like flying in and attacking you from all sides, even though you can only shoot forward. I hate that. You need to have like a back shot or something like that to maintain the onslaught, but yet you can't. And there are like walls in this game that will guarantee your death unless you find like a specific white bell at exactly the correct time and then use a mechanic that the game never told you even existed and you never had to use before to progress. That's really irritating. That is so irritating. And really the game is just like extremely unfair and unbalanced and cheap. And you can tell that the developers kind of like planned this <laughs> to go along with the whole humor theme of the game. You can tell that they thought it was like really hilarious to watch you suffer. And that's part of the thing of the game. Like it's super zany and over the top, even in its difficulty. And on this PSP collection, they've taken pity on you and they allow you to like save your game but you can only save at like certain checkpoints in each stage. Maybe there's like three checkpoints or so. And even with doing that, the game is extremely difficult and tedious to finish. Like there are sections of this game where they lock you in this little thin corridor and there are just falling blocks from the ceiling that fall in almost random patterns. And getting through that feels like there's about a 10% chance that you can do it. And then right after that, you have to fight a boss. And that's like all one checkpoint. So if you want to get experience fighting that boss, you have to go through that freaking rock falling section over and over and over again. And I did not like that. By all accounts, people consider this to be the worst Parodius game. And I can understand why. <laughs> but it was still fun and it was charming. And I did beat it. I didn't one credit clear it. Not by any stretch of the imagination. I just used save games like this was not an arcade game. This was a home console game on the MSX computer. So beating it doesn't really involve having the one credit cleared. It's just getting through it, which I did, barely. <laughs> so Parodius on the PSP collection is good. It's not great. I would say it's a six out of 10. If you're a fan of the series or some shoot 'em ups you've got to play it. You've probably already played it. But if you haven't, maybe give it a shot and try out that MSX version as well. All right, we're down to the last game, and here is where I'm gonna tell you how you can win the $100 that I'm giving away in this video. I didn't wanna put it at the end, because I didn't want people just to skip to the end to find it. I only wanna leave this for the people that are really fans of the channel that watch all the way through the videos. So last year I did the same kind of giveaway, and I made it too easy, and I had this big influx of random people from all over the world that like only sign up for random giveaways, and they're like little group gathers together and they just overwhelm every single giveaway to guarantee that they're going to win. And that's not going to happen this time. <laughs> so here's how you can win the $100. Somewhere in this video, maybe before this part of the video, maybe after this part of the video, I've hidden a four digit number and it's hidden well. Maybe it's on like a piece of paper behind me. Maybe it's somewhere else in the video. But if you can find that four digit number, the first person who tells me what the number is and then messages me on Facebook, Twitter, slash X, or Instagram is gonna win the $100. And I'll just PayPal it to you or Venmo it to you or something like that. Good luck. <laughs> it's not easy this time. So this last game is an Atari 2600 game, which I really like, but I know a lot of people out there don't like Atari games, so I put it at the end. So only the really hardcore fans get to see it. Now, the Atari only outputs RF, and there's no way to really run that into a capture card without running first into a VCR and then running the VCR out to your capture card. And I tried that, and for some reason, my capture card did not like it. It would show the game for like 10 seconds, and then it would shut off and have like a black screen for 30 seconds. So, I had to AV mod my entire freaking Atari just to capture this gameplay footage. And I was so upset, because I did not have a good time with this game. <laughs> and it is Kroll. And this is based off the movie that came out, I guess, in the 80s. So Kroll's fiance gets kidnapped, like, at their wedding. And you have to basically get her back. It's a save the princess sort of game. 
Like a lot of Atari 2600 games, it seems really simple, but it's more overly complex than you would ever expect. <laughs> and I had to look up how to play it. I spent like 30 minutes like just fumbling around and couldn't figure out what to do. There's four screens in the game. The first screen is like Space Invaders, except instead of shooting, which is cool, you have to stab everyone. And eventually you will just get overrun. They will grab the bride and then the game goes into the second screen which is like an auto running side scroller where you have to time a button press to grab like the glaive, which is like a thrown bladed weapon that's at the bottom of the screen. After a certain amount of time, the game automatically progresses to the third screen, whether you grab the glaive or not. And I'm gonna say this right now, this is not an exaggeration. Screen three is one of the most frustrating and annoying experiences I have ever encountered in any game ever. There are these spider webs that like radiate out in these difficult to navigate patterns and you have to jump over them. And the only issue is that you can only jump like horizontally going left to right and you can't jump vertically over the vertical axis. There's no way to go up. And if one of the freaking webs touches you, which they will, you stick to it and it drags you in the direction it's going and you can barely break free. Like it's almost impossible to break free. And if you get in one of those spots where like the webs overlap, you're basically just screwed. It like will just keep pushing you back and forth and there's no way to get out. And there's this freaking spider that's like randomly roaming around and it will kill you if you touch it. And it always seems to be like in between you and where you're trying to go. And the whole point of this screen is that you have to get your way up to the white box at the top of the screen, which will reveal where the hidden exit is. Then you have to like avoid and fight through all the freaking webs to get over to the exit. And you have to do all this before the timer runs out or this spider will just go crazy and automatically attack you and kill you. And it's not that long. You have to really be on your game to do this. And if you manage to make it to the freaking exit, it goes back into the second screen, which is the auto running side scroller and you get another chance to grab the glaive, but you're going like five times faster than you did the first time, so it makes it even more challenging. And if you manage to do all of this, you made it through like the stabbing Space Invaders section, the auto running screen, the web screen, found the exit, made it back to the second freaking auto running screen before the sun sets, meaning there's another timer, like a universal timer that's sitting on top of the whole game, you'll get to go to the boss's fortress. If you went to the wrong exit or you took too long, the game will send you out to the auto-scrolling section. Anything you pick up doesn't count. You get a wah wah sound and it sends you right back to the web room again. If you do all this in the right amount of time and you grab the glaive and you make it to the boss room, you can throw the glaive at the walls of the prison to like chip away at them, kind of like in breakout, but you have to catch the glaive on the rebound. <laughs> and it is so hard to do. If you miss, do it all again. If you accidentally throw the glaive at the boss, do it all again. Throw the glaive past the jail, do it all again. Get shot by the boss, do it all again. And when the glaive hits the wall, it only takes out like one little tiny pixel. So you need to catch the glaive like, I don't know, 15, 20 times or something like that to save the girl. But honestly, I was never able to do it. I got so close so many times. People online say they like this game. I do not agree with them. I think Kroll is one of the worst games I've ever played and I hate that it beat me and I didn't get to beat it. <laughs> I spent a few hours playing with it and it like ruined my afternoon. I was in a terrible mood and it is so tiring. My hands were cramping up and so sore from that freaking spider web section. It is terrible. So how is Kroll on the 2600? The game is like a 3 out of 10. It is terrible. It is awful. It's something you should never play, even if you like the movie. It's cool that it follows, I guess, the plot of the movie from what I can hear, but like, that's not going to save bad gameplay. All right, guys, there were the six games that were randomly picked for me to play. There were some really good ones. There were some really bad ones, which is exactly what you want in a video like this. If you made it this far into the video, guys, I really appreciate it. Be sure to like the video. That helps with the algorithm comment, I answer like every one of them, and subscribe if you want to see more of me, of course. 
If you're here to try to find out how to win the hundred dollars, it's not in this part of the video. You got to find it somewhere else. Keep looking. <laughs> I would also like to take this as an opportunity to thank the channel members and the Patreons. You can see their names on the screen right now. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or sponsor part of the video, or get access to the videos early, as well as the member exclusive videos, you can find the link down in the description how to become a channel member, or you can find me on Patreon as well under RNG Gamer. Every dollar goes right back into this channel, and I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll catch you guys next time.